just got out of seeing. Well, uh, recording. Hello, I just recently saw Kong Skull Island in theaters. This is the latest installment of what I would best describe as the legend, as uh, the legendary Godzilla cinematic universe, or legendary films Godzilla cinematic universe. Um. Coming into this film, I knew that Legendary Pictures had greenlit already for Godzilla King of the Monsters 2019, which I think has been pushed back to 2020, that this film was going to have Godzilla fighting King Kong, their first outing against each other since the 1970s, 1960s, like late 60s, early 70s. So I was... So this film is basically establishing Kong in this cinematic universe. Now... Obviously, this is not the first King Kong film. I mean, we've had, not including Kong's fight for Godzilla, we've had three Kong adaptations in the past. The original film by RKO Pictures, now owned by Warner's, Warner Brothers, the Universal remake, and then the Peter Jackson version. And so the question kind of came to this was, okay, how? what are we doing with King Kong? The last two, last three films that were just focused on Kong himself tended to pretty much tell the same story in each film. And the short version is, is this film definitely is very different from the previous King Kong films. And it definitely fits well with this concept of setting up a larger universe of megafauna. Now, coming into this film, one of the things that you do have to keep under consideration, and keep in mind, is that this is, I mean, this is a movie about megafauna, it's a kaiju film, even though it is not your standard big G Godzilla film, it's, it is a, it is a kaiju film, there are giant monsters who are duking it out against each other, so that is something that you kind of got to keep under consideration. Um, the premise of the film itself has, in the 1970s, when the Landsat project starts, the U.S. government discovers a previously undiscovered island in the South Pacific called Skull Island. Now, if you're not familiar with Landsat, this was a real-world po real project basically involving mapping the world using spy satellite, or using satellite imagery. Among other things that came out of this was a much more detailed map of the borders in South America, a map of the Amazon rainforest, which in turn both led to the deforestation and exploitation of the Amazon basin, and then in turn the environmental evidence needed to show what detrimental effects that the clearing of the Amazon basin was having, and in turn allowing for environmentalists to push back against that. So... In this case, with the film, what we got is we have um, <clears throat> this in, in the waning days of the Vietnam War, a group of scientists from Monarch, if you're not, which is the organization established in the previous Kong film, the Godzilla 2014 film, going to Skull Island alongside a Landsat mapping expedition and roping in a military escort. The Monarch team is led by Dr. Rand uh, Randa, played by John Goodman, who is dismissed as a cook by the government and people in the Senate and that sort of thing. And so his plan is to use that there's, due to all the myths and legends about this place, there's got to be megafauna here. So he's going to drive out the megafauna, for like flush it out, and document this and prove that this, that got, that the big G wasn't the only one out there. There's more giant monsters and we need to be ready for them. And so, this leads to a military group led by Samuel L. Jackson's character, Colonel Packard, who are Air Cavalry, a helicopter squadron, were sent in to bring in the expedition to and to drop seismic charges for ostensibly mapping the geology of the area. 
but also flushing out the biggest of the big game. And if you've seen the trailers, you know thing goes things go bad. Things go really bad. They also have on this expedition, by the way, a um, James Conrad, played by Tom Hiddleston. Conrad is a former mercenary, well, no former mercenary, a mercenary, formerly of the SAS, who gets brought into this basically because he has experience operating in jungle areas, in some cases jungle areas where the places have not been mapped, and if they end up on the ground and if they end up getting lost or things go bad, they'll need his help. Things go bad, they need his help a lot. So, I'm not going to just go spoil much about this, because as I'm recording this, I'm recording this opening weekend for the film, and this is going to go live on the 15th, so the Wednesday following. So, that, I'm going to leave, leave the, the, the nitty-gritty details out of this. And so in the meantime, the film, we'll just focus on the film itself in terms of the structure and how well it's executed and that sort of thing. The acting performances in this film are great. Tom Hiddleston is excellent. Samuel L. Jackson and John Goodman couldn't phone it in if you tried to make them. Like Even John Goodman in the Speed Racer movie was fantastic. By com- And if anything, the weaknesses of this film... John C. Riley, who plays a shot-down U.S. pilot, uh, is great in this film. He... Riley is known for his comedic roles. The trailers kind of set him up a little bit as a comic relief character, but he is not a har har yuck yuck comic relief character that undermines the tension of the scenes he's in. Quite the contrary, he is a person who's been on the island more than anyone else. He knows it more than anyone else. His comic relief elements come from the fact that he's kind of a little unhinged by not having much human contact and human conversation with people from the Western world for. To, for coming up on three decades. And when things go bad, his comic relief also comes to the fact that people don't necessarily go with him, don't necessarily trust him, even though, hey, he's been here the longest. He, there's a great quip he has in the movie, which is basically, um, well, I've been here 27 years, what do I know? Which is a great, wonderful little line. So, there's him. Um, the film's weakness, if I was to, to point out a particular point as a weakness, is one of the members of the cast is fairly well underused. Um, the chi- the expedition, there are three members of Monarch on the team. There is Ran- Dr. Randa, played by Goodman. There is um, Dr. Brooks, Dr. Houston Brooks, played by Corey Hawkins. And there's Dr. Lin, uh, San Lin, played by Jing Tan. Um... This being a ten-cent co-production, this is basically from what I can guess. Her character is in here to help with the Chinese demographic, to help get the move with ten-cent co-producing, help get the film in Chinese theaters and get around the limits of number of foreign films, number of by the way, I mean Western films aired and um, broadcast, well, not broadcast, released in China every year. Trying to find the right word and. In some cases of these films, there are additional scenes with these Chinese actors and actresses for the Chinese audience. And we don't have any of that in the Western release for this film, which is a bummer because we had a bunch of great, neat scenes with Dr. Brooks, with Corey Hawkins, where he's talking about how he's a geologist, he graduated Yale, he did some seismological research, which fit... And, and, and supported some of Randa's theories about not so, about the hollow earth. Not like the full hollow earth. There's another planet completely on the inside, or land mass, completely on the, like, upside down and on the inside of the planet earth. But there are cavities underneath the planet's surface where there are big monstrous critters that can come out. And certain places it's thin enough or open enough that these things can come out and this is where the megafauna is coming from, and this is where we're getting things like Godzilla and the Mudos and that sort of thing from the first movie, the 2014 movie. And he has this great scene where he talked about how he was dismissed as a kook and a crack because of crackpot because of his research, and then Randa supported him and got him the job with Monarch, 
even though Randa is himself kind of kind of nutty. And so we get a really good sense of why he's here, why he got roped into this insane thing. But we don't get the same sense for Lynn. We don't get the sense of, like, her biological theory, whether she has, like, research or biological theories and how megafauna might sustain itself, and that, that she got laughed out of whatever research institution she was at, and found herself at Monarch, or that sort of thing. I... Like, that's gotta be a scene that's in the Chinese release, and I really hope that when this movie hits DVD and Blu-ray, that'll be on the deleted scenes, or an extended cut that incorporates that information, because... As the film stands, Jin Tian, as an actress, has very little material on screen. What she does get, she does well. She... Uh, ha she oftentimes ends up in the position of having to react to things, which, like, everyone's having to react to things. There's all sorts of megafauna going on that you've never seen before, and so everyone is in awe or scared out of their minds, more the latter towards the end of the film, and having that, and having her do more than that would be great, but what she does get to do, she does really well. She does a really good job of getting across that this is a terrifying, pants-crappingly intense experience and it and she sells it which is what you need if you have anyone who doesn't sell any of this quite right if they can't appropriately get or convey the threat and menace of these things which are not there the movie falls flat but everyone does this really well uh we have brie larson as a photojournalist uh mason weaver who is brought along on the mission to um, basically document the thing because they want to bring back proof. And we're not doing the actual King Kong classic depiction thing of you go to Skull Island, you find Kong, you knock him out, you bring him back to the big city where he run runs rampant, kills people, and then is killed himself. Because Kong this movie is huge. Kong this movie is over like 100 foot, 150 feet tall, and... You're not loading him on a boat. So she is basically documents the expedition in addition to the scientific data that's being provided by, well, the Monarch team. And so she, she serves a purpose and of, of all the intrepid reporters get brought on to stuff like this. And everything works really well and it makes for a great film uh, for, for this cast. Narratively, the film is very much a survival, uh, escape and evade kind of story. The helicopter teams come in, they drop their seismic charges, Kong takes offense to people dropping bombs in his turf, wrecks their crap, and so they have to make for, make it to the evac point before the resupply team comes and goes because they don't want to be stuck here for another 30 years. Or, well, for another, in the case of John C. Reilly's character, 30 years until another team comes in to find out what the hell happened. And the world of Skull Island is well done. And I appreciate what they do here with by bringing up the little bit of, not so much hollow earth, but um, things living beneath the earth. Megafauna beneath the earth in the uh, story's plotline. Because that, combined with the ecosystem that we see depicted on Skull Island, it sets up that if for later films they want to introduce Monster Island, if they want to introduce Mothra's home island, there's a way to set that up. It, it gives a justification for that existing. Yes, megafauna in the really real world can't exist. Not of that scale, and not as terrestrial megafauna. Most of the megafauna that we found paleontological evidence of of the scale-ish tend to be aquatic megafauna. Giant shark, super giant shark kind of thing. Um, kind of things. And these are terrestrial. They're walking insectoid creatures. They're walking, there's a giant multi-antler, multi-horned water buffalo they encounter. But they, if you make the assumption coming into this film, if you Recognize that for any, that for giant monster creatures like that, 
picture features like this, you have to make the assumption that megafauna exists, that for the purposes of this film, you need to roll with the fact that in this environment, these creatures can take in the calories they need to exist to survive and move around, that they can hold up their own weight in the environment that they are in, and you roll from there. If you make those two, if, if you make that assumption, if we, we take the, accept the impossible thing for this film, th as is kind of the thing with most fantasy films, is you need to assume at least one, maybe a couple impossible things, like truly impossible things, otherwise the film it can never really work. Assume megafauna can exist, then the ecosystem of this island, as depicted, kind of makes sense. We have not just predators, as is the common catch with these things, like with the original King Kong film. You don't just have predatory creatures. You have a full food chain. You have um, ambush predators and active hunters. You have herbivores. You have giant herbivores, which is something you don't normally get unless you're doing something like Jurassic Park, where you're you're taking established extinct prehistoric creatures and bringing them back into the modern world. You, there is a, the, the, the food chain, while we don't see the full thing, you get the glimpse of what you see of the creature's behavior and how the environment works, that there is a food chain present here. It's not flawless. Megafauna tends, in the film, tends to come in one-offs. We don't see a herd of giant water buffalo. We just see the one that you see in the trailer. You don't see swarms of giant insects. You see onesies, twosies. There are all plenty of other new predatory wildlife that is nasty and that come in more substantial groups, uh, or herbivore wildlife that are also nat that that come in uh, groups at a more normal size. But the megafauna is a little more spread out, which also kind of makes sense, but also if we're looking at this from a genetic standpoint, it leads to a small gene pool. But, as it stands, the film does a good job of setting up a world where Skull Island makes sense within its context, and thus, because of this broader universe that we're building in this film, that's being built in this film, other islands with megafauna, Mothra's Island, Monster Island, that sort of thing, those also make sense in context. And you can have them show up, and it works. As far as the actions of the characters in the film, Samuel L. Jackson's character basically ends up going full Ahab, wants to kill Kong in revenge for his troops that were killed when the helicopters were downed by Kong, and... But in the kind of the context of the film, it, it works for his characterization... It's one of those things where probably in the really real world, someone would be grabbing a sedative, knock him out and strap him up until they can get back to the world. But in the context of the film where, where people are sufficiently cowed by authority to be willing to roll with some of this stuff that he's up to, it works. Acting performances are great. Music is great. They show the monster early. It's definitely a case where, as King Kong, they took their sweet time of showing us the Mudos. They kept us in suspense and keeping things in shadow, both so we don't know, uh, the audience don't necessarily know what the Mudos are, so they can sneak attack people and come out of nowhere and making them a scary threat. Here, the monsters are all up and in your face all the time, so, I mean, there, there are plenty of monsters who come out of nowhere and do the ambush in that way, but, when the monsters show up, you see the monster, and thus you, you have a really good sense of threat and, and menace from them. And it really made for a really suspenseful and intense film. I really enjoyed that. So. Pretty much covers the basis for Kong. Let me know what you think about the movie. Please refrain from spoilers in the credits. Uh, in, in the comments. And oh, I'll do future vlog posts for other movies when I see them in theaters. Thank you very much for watching.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.